for connecting to our recording service. Wonderful, we are recording. So again, welcome. Um, I would like to first pass it over to Neil McCrillis, who is our Vice Provost for Global Engagement, and he is going to give a welcome to everyone today. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever the appropriate greeting is, wherever you may be. I'm uh, very glad to be spending some time with you. As a UIC alumnus myself, I care a great deal about the institution, but more so even about our community, our community of students, faculty, and staff. And uh, in this time of what I would prefer to call spatial or physical distancing rather than um, you know, being separate from one another, uh, it's important for me, and I, I think for all of us, to, to hear from each other, to try to understand what challenges each of you are facing, and is to the best of our ability to try to provide some guidance and support uh, during this very difficult time for, for everybody, but I think particularly for our international student population, international student and scholar uh, population. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm pleased to be able to hear from you, at least through the questions, and uh, also to, to hear what guidance uh, our colleagues, my colleagues are able to provide uh, because they're the experts, I am not, um, but I hope to be learning something through the process uh, of being uh, participating in this town hall and, and I hope the, the other ones that are upcoming. So I look forward to it and um, I will be listening very closely. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you Dr. McCrillis. Um, next up, we have Jim Hammerschmidt, who is our Associate Vice Provost for Global Engagement and the Executive Director of uh, in, oh, uh, the Office of International Services. And he is going to give an overview of our topic today, which is travel and immigration. Thank you, Anna. Um, welcome again to this, the first of uh, a few of our town hall meetings. I, I want to kind of give you a brief overview. Uh, the topics uh, that we have chosen actually came, as Anna said, from the feedback that we, we received from a lot of you, as well as the the emails that we're receiving for uh, in the Office of International Services. Uh, I want to assure you that the entire staff of the Office of International Services is available uh, virtually. So uh, your questions and concerns can be answered if there's some individual ones uh, that you're worried about. Uh, please feel free to contact us. We'll give you some more information as we go through uh, this webinar, um, but we are available. Uh, throughout the day, five days a week. Documents are going out uh, and being mailed, uh, so you don't have to worry about, uh, about uh, not getting a, a travel signature or whatever it is. So I assure you that we, we are your strongest advocate and we are here uh, at UIC uh, working uh, to ensure that you remain uh, in status as much as we can possibly do that. In addition to that, I thought I'd take this opportunity to basically uh, talk briefly about fed, on the federal level kind of what immigration, uh, what was going on. And basically a lot, of, a lot of information, a lot of guidance is coming out from the Student Exchange Visitor Program. And that agency is the one that's in charge of, of what we call the SEVA system. And I know a lot of you are aware of the SEVA system. There's, that's what we, uh, the electronic system, the federal government has put into place. Um, and so in, in that guidance, there is quite a bit of flexibility. As you know, there, it addresses anything from online, uh, full-time online courses during this pandemic, as well as some helpful hints, not only for the international students, uh, but also for the academic institutions. And so we are monitoring that very closely to ensure that you get the information. So please, 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 uh, when we send out these email announcements, uh, take time to read, read those announcements. In addition to that, we update our frequently asked questions on our website as soon as new information becomes available from the federal government. In addition to that, from your feedback, we also add additional questions that maybe we didn't think of uh, that you have posed. So we are updating that basis so please, as, a, as, a, as a reference. Um, with that said, though, the U.S. Uh, Immigration Service, uh, that is the agency that 
that handles any changes of status or OPT applications, uh, as well as the enforcement side, they have been silent during this entire time of any kind of guidance. And so a lot of the questions that we have seen coming through our office is related to those kinds of applications. And at this particular stage, there is no guidance. Um, a lot of the uh, agencies and district offices have been closed. And so are, are narrow, I should say not closed, but, but basically uh, um, staff has been working uh, tele, telecommuting like we have. And so a lot of the cases are getting slowed down as far as the processing. Uh, again, we're monitoring it as much as we can, um, but that agency is is not forthcoming right now with a lot of the flexibility, I guess you could say, during this pandemic. St so stay tuned. Uh, with that, Hannah, I'll turn it over to you and uh, we can start the questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Hammerschmidt. Um, so yes, now we're gonna move on to the questions. Uh, we received a lot of really good questions and we've sort of synthesized them into about eight different topics. And so joining us to answer some of these are uh, Megan Ward, our Director of International Student Services and Outreach, and Kathleen Pender, our Associate Director for International Student Services. Um, along with Jim, they're going to answer these questions. So let's get to it. The first one is probably the most popular question and that was about international travel. So what should an international student think about when considering travel that will take them outside the U.S.? What happens if they cannot return to Chicago for the fall semester due to embassy closures or travel restrictions? Okay, so, so if a student is thinking about traveling outside the United States, um, same kind of rules apply. So basically, ensure that your passport hasn't expired. Uh, make sure that the visa in your passport um, and it has multiple entries because, as you know, some of the embassies around the world are temporarily shut down. Um, and so uh, getting a visa or applying for a new visa, there may be some delay. So be prepared for that. Uh, plan ahead. Travel.state.gov uh, will list the embassies and their processing times just like uh, they used to do in which the, they will tell you roughly how long it takes if you needed to renew your visa. Uh, the I-20, the immigration document that we've issued out of the Office of International Services, ensure that you have a, a travel signature. If you don't, send us an email and we will prepare a new I-20 for travel signature and mail it directly to you. Um, and so that, that with a travel signature, the end date, of your I-20 to ensure that the end date uh, it reflects the amount of time that it will take to complete your program. If you travel outside the United States and are concerned now because of all of the travel restrictions and embassy closures, um, be aware that you need to, to uh, as, as you're online as far as course-wise, make sure you stay in contact with not only the Office of International Services, but with your academic department. Um, there could be a chance that a delay occurs and they could work out something else or we could defer uh, you coming back in what we call a possibility of a study abroad um, uh, part of, of that until the embassies open up. Um, but my, my best advice is, because each one of you comes from a different country, my best advice to you is to ensure that you stay in contact with the Office of International Services. Make sure your immigration documents. Uh, make sure you stay enrolled, and uh, we can we can go from there and advise you appropriately. Thank you, Jim. The next question is about online classes. So. What is the impact of an international student's immigration status if they decide to enroll for online classes this summer? And can they take these classes online from abroad? What do we know about online classes and international student status for the fall semester? 
Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to say we miss seeing your faces in the office, and we will look forward to that happening again. In terms of online classes, um, as you all know, um, to maintain your status in normal, normal times, um, only one three credit hour class could count towards your full time enrollment offered in a distance education format. So when schools, when this, the pandemic started and when schools decided to take classes from an on ground format to an online format, um, SEBP and immigration also in turn moved forward with allowing international students those on F1 and J1 student visas, um, to be able to take all of their courses online, whether they're in the United States or outside the United States. That continues to be the case. That is allowed. You can enroll full time um, in an online format for the entire summer. In terms of what will happen in the fall, we are still waiting for university administration to make a decision as to whether or not classes will be offered on ground um, at the UIC campus, or if we will continue with online classes. If the decision is made to continue distance education, you will again, um, it is our assumption, um, I, I don't want to say for sure, but it is our assumption that US Immigration and the Student Exchange Visitor Program will continue to allow students to take those classes in a distance education format. UIC is not closing, um, we will continue to offer education and we are hopeful that immigration in turn will continue to allow students um, to take all of their classes online as well. All right. Thank you, Megan. The next question has to do with passports and visas. So, as we know, many embassies around the world are closed due to COVID-19 or if they're not closed, they're experiencing delays. Does OIS know when U.S. embassies abroad will reopen and, and what should international student do if they need to renew a passport or apply for a U.S. visa? And then following up on that, does an international student need to renew their visa if they intend to remain in the U.S. for study or for OPT? Okay, I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we don't have any inside uh, information as far as what embassies are closed. So we, we basically monitor very closely, again, the travel.state.gov and the embassies. There's a whole list. And, and I think at the end of this, we'll also, in our frequently asked questions, provide you that hyperlink uh, so you can watch. It, goes, it breaks down by country and then by city within that. So it kind of tells you which ones are which ones aren't, and, and, and roughly you can hyperlink to those to find out availability uh, for any, uh, any of those embassies. Um, as far as the second question about uh, renewing your passport, your passport is actually uh, something that your, your home country issues. And so you would strongly encourage you to monitor the, um, your embassy here in the United States to, to see if, A, if they're processing some of the embassies I know from had with some of you and some of our international employees, some of them are, are making uh, uh, ways around this social distancing and, and having the, your passport of where they're currently uh, working, whether that be home or a different location. So just be aware uh, of your, your own embassy and seeing if the, that as far as your visa your passport, that is the key to get into the United States. Your plans are not to leave the United States. The visa and the passport is not something that you would have to renew. It only needs to be renewed if you depart the United States and want to return to the and, and then return to the United States at a later date with uh, your visa to be valid. Um, does an international student need to re renew the visa if they intend to remain, if, as I said, for studying OPT? Again, the visa is only used uh, for the travel back to the United States. So in the cases of OPT, uh, you, if you're going to plan to stay here in the United States, that can expire. It's the immigration document, the I-20, that we issue that gives you that the, uh, helps you maintain your status while you're here. So that's what you would want to ensure that that remains current. 
and all the, the uh, regulations surrounding optional practical training are upheld, meaning that you know, the employment that you are seeking or are been employed in is uh, related to your academic program. Uh, any unemployment, times of unemployment, you need to, to notify the Office of International Services on. Great. Yeah, I think a lot of um, students think that if their visa is expiring, they have to travel and that body to press, but maybe not the case if they intend to stay. <laughs> All right. The next question is um, about cross course and visa, or I'm sorry, um, program extensions and graduate assistantships. So give me one second here. I'm going to change something. Okay. So program extensions and graduate assistantships. This was another common question and concern for people. So some graduate international students are unable to conduct their research as a result of the stay at home order. As a result, they will not be able to complete their program by the date listed on their I-20. What should they do? Will academic departments provide additional semesters of funding via assistantship? Great, um, I'll take the question. Um, as you all know, uh, program extension is, would need to be filed, uh, requested through the Office of International Services before the current end date on the I-20 that you hold. I-20s are issued for an estimate of how long it takes for most people um, at your degree level to finish the program. If you require additional time, we will consider a program extension. Program extensions, in order to be granted a program extension, um, you do need to have extenuating circumstances and a valid academic reason um, for the program extension or the need for additional time to complete your degree program. If um, we are provided with that through the program extension application, um, we will consider the extension. And if there are valid academic reasons why you require the extension, we would be happy to process the extension for you. Um, needing additional time to complete research requirements is typically considered a valid reason. So I don't know why our office would not be able to consider that. So I definitely encourage everyone who is having issues um, with uh, research, um, needing to extend research, so please reach out to us. Um, we can assist through the process, of course, and um, let you know if you would be eligible for an extension. In terms of funding through the extension period, in our office, we don't make any decisions um, on funding, so I encourage you to reach out to your academic department. For the most part, departments um, are able to extend funding periods from what I have seen through extension periods. But again, that is not for our department to decide. So as part of the extension process, you will be reaching out to your department. And at that time, you could get confirmation from your department that funding would be extended for you. So definitely reach out to our office if you have questions about extending your I-20, the requirements for the extension, um, and we would be happy to walk you through that process. Great, thanks, Megan. And just a, a follow up when it comes to program extension, about how long does that process take, or when would you recommend a student begin that conversation with OIS? Great question. So, I would typically say a few months is great if you can start that process. Um, you know, we don't want to do it too far in advance in case your circumstances change. We extend out the program and then you don't end up needing it. But if you are sure that an extension is what you will need, um, please start the process at least 30 days in advance of your I-20 expiring, um, but the sooner the better um, it is always best. Did I answer the question fully? Anna? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to another popular topic is curricular practical training or CPT. So what should an international student who either wants to or is required to participate in CPT, know about internships during the stay at home order. Can CPT be done remotely? And can CPT be done from abroad? Thanks, Anna, I'll take that question. So like Anna said, for anyone who's not familiar, CPT stands for Curricular Practical Training. So this is off campus work authorization when the student has a curricular requirement to complete some sort of off campus experience. 
So this might mean that your degree program is requiring you to do research off campus or maybe complete an internship off campus as part of obtaining your degree. So nothing has changed in the regulations regarding CPT during this time, but a lot of questions are coming up about doing CPT remotely. So maybe you had CPT authorized for the summer, but now your employer is saying, well, everyone's telecommuting, you're not going to be physically in an office, and is that okay? So the answer to that is yes, CPT can be done remotely. It also can be done from your home country. If you have returned home or you're planning to return home, what the government wants to see is that your, um, your curricular practical training site supervisor um, either has an office outside the United States that you'll be physically going to, or that that individual or the employer can assess your engagement and attainment of those learning objectives electronically. So that means they have a, a way to be able to um, continue to supervise you, continue to monitor your ability to obtain those objectives laid out in your CPT application from abroad. So yes, CPT can be done remotely. It can be done from your home country. What's important to keep in mind with CPT is that it does still need to be authorized in advance of your start date. So you do still need to submit an application to our office in advance. Make sure that that gets approved in time before you begin. Um, that application, of course, can be submitted to us electronically. It doesn't need to be submitted to us as paper at this time. Um, but you do want to make sure that you go ahead and, and have that done in advance. Great. Great. That's some reassuring news about CPT for sure. Um, and as is usually the case, conversations about CPT lead to OPT, or optional practical training. So what do international students graduating in spring and summer 2020 need to know about applying for OPT? Can an international student who is currently outside the US submit an application for OPT? Okay, so I'll go ahead and continue with that one since we're continuing to talk about employment. So at this point in time, nothing has changed in the regulations pertaining to OPT either. We advise students who will be graduating after this term and wish to travel home to carefully consider the risks and benefits um, as it pertains to your ability to apply for OPT. So currently, USCIS, where you file that OPT application, will still only accept those applications submitted within the United States. So this means if you've left the United States or plan to leave the United States, you cannot submit that application from outside the country. They will only accept it within the United States. Now that's something that's being evaluated and we hope to get more clarity on that at some point, but currently those, those rules have not changed. So you'll wanna keep that in mind if you are planning to travel home that you perhaps wanna make sure you get that application submitted prior to your departure. Now, if you do that, another thing to keep in mind is that any documentation that USCIS is going to send to you will need to be sent to your United States mailing address. So this means any receipt notices, requests for additional information, ultimately an approval notice or an EAD card if your application is approved, those things are going to go to your US mailing address. So ideally you want somebody who's going to be there to be able to receive those items, notify you of those items, or forward those to you if you need to receive those at home. Um, so like I said, these are, these are things that are being evaluated. If additional information comes out, we'll communicate that right away. But currently the regulations surrounding applying for OPT have not changed. So if you are kind of balancing those options of you know, when should you travel, when should you apply, please reach out to us and one of our advisors can help you to walk through those timelines and, and make sure that you are able to apply for OPT before leaving the United States. Great, thank you for that. So switching topics a bit, um, some other questions we received were about people experiencing financial hardship. So what should an international student who are experiencing financial hardship due to COVID-19 know? Are there any additional immigration benefits or changes to regulations that would allow an international student to work additional hours or even work off campus to earn more money? So I'll take that one and kind of give everybody an up-to-date uh, 
information on that. First and foremost, if you are experiencing that, uh, please also let our office know. Uh, we are working with the various units and colleges here at the university uh, to see if fun there is any in internal funding that may be available. But as far as the government goes, uh, USCIS only has um, the ability to approve or at least to review a case for economic hardship. And at that particular stage, it is, it is up to the international student, uh, and we'll advise you accordingly uh, to file an application for economic hardship. So there are some supporting documentation that you would need. Uh, they have not in any way reduced the amount of information that they would request to prove economic hardship. Uh, so you can certainly file, there is a fee. Uh, at times you can request a waiver of that fee, uh, but at this particular stage, those are few and far between being granted. Under the CARES Act, which that's the stimulus program that uh, President Trump uh, has signed in, into law, there is some conditions as far as those individuals that may be uh, working and claiming as a resident for tax purpose to get the uh, stimulus checks. And some, I understand, students both at UIC as well as other universities have received those checks. Those are not considered to be public charge. Uh, so um, you've received the check, uh, if you pay taxes type of a thing, then to the best of our knowledge, um, that, is, that is grant money uh, from, from the federal government. In addition, um, the Dean of Students Office is also, um, also planning to um, uh, offer and very limited funds, uh, what we call the emergency grant. Typically, the emergency grants uh, that they have available are only for $500. Uh, so it's 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 not a significant amount of money, but it may help you uh, in the short term of that. One of the things that the Dean of Students Office has indicated to me today is that um, you know the applications that the international students are submitting, not all of them are complete. So there is it's online. Uh, if you go to the Dean of Students Office and look at UI Care. Um, there's an application, so please make sure you complete and provide all of the documentation. They're fairly quick on the response uh, if you are going to be given that grant, uh, and that's just to help with other costs. It actually goes through your student accounts, um, so we, they work closely with financial aid. In addition to that, right now, and more details will come, be coming, uh, according to the Dean of uh, the Graduate College, um, but they are looking at internship opportunities uh, throughout the summer. In addition to that, uh, the Dean has also reached out to the various departments to see if there's a possibility of extending assistantship funding and all that throughout the summer. So the only thing that I can say to you is stay tuned. If we get any updates on that, we will make sure we direct you uh, to those sources, um, but your individual departments and the graduate college, uh, for those of you that are graduate students, um, will also be sending out information. So that should be forthcoming uh, very soon. So the other thing is, um, once the semester ends, uh, the spring semester ends, um, the regulations allow, again, these have not changed, that you're allowed to work, again, 40 hours a week on campus. Um, but right now, you're, you're still in session, so it's considered 20 hours a week during the term. So be, be, be mindful of that. Those regulations and guidance has not changed in any, any way uh, from the federal government. Um, so, okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is about getting help from OIA. So how should an international student who have specific questions that weren't answered today get help from OIS? Are OIS advisors still available for advising sessions? And how could I get a travel signature or other request processed during the stay-at-home order? 
Absolutely. So we are definitely available, same hours. I feel like we have more advising times now. We're open for advising Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 5. The best way to get assistance is to email OIS, so OIS at UIC.edu. And all I monitor that email all day long. That's me. <laughs> so I'm assigning the cases to our advisors, giving advisors the emails to call and reach out to students. Um, as most students, I would say the majority of you, um, prefer the email advising, and that's just fine. Um, but we are also here to provide WebEx advising if you would like to do that. You would prefer to just talk, no video, that's fine. Whatever way we can help you, um, we want to be here for you. Um, and we, I want to reassure you um, that we are here. Um, we are still advising. We are processing all of the cases that come into our office. Um, thank you all for your patience in terms of us transitioning from, you know, this is an unprecedented time, so transitioning from, you know, on-ground services to online services, I feel like we've been able to do that quite well. Um, so processing times may be a day or two longer. I think we have um, evened that out a little bit and we're back to sort of our regular processing times. Um, so I think that you should all rest assured. Um, that you will get all of your documents that you need. If there is anything that is urgent, um, please, when you're sending your email to OIS, just put in your email that this is an urgent issue. I need to speak to someone immediately, um, you know, and we will accommodate you um, as we normally would. So um, if you call our office, um, you will be directed to the OIS email, but we do still have um, our staff answering our, our front desk phone. Um, that has been rerouted, um, but we are we are here, phone, email, WebEx, if you need us. Great. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, it's hard to kind of picture with all of us being so distant just how all this works and the processing works, but it's working, it's happening, the advising is <laughs> happening. Um, <laughs> it's it definitely is. been a learning process for all of us too, but it's exciting to see the contact still going on. So, yes. um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that that sums up the pre-submitted moderated questions that we we gathered. I don't know if our panelists here are able to look at the Q and A's that are being submitted. Um, our colleague Stephen has been diligently responding to many of these already. Um, but and and as you know, Stephen, it in any space where we're meeting, whether it's public or virtual, in person, um, if it's a public event, we generally aren't able to answer very specific case questions because we need to be looking at your immigration record um, to, to see all the nuances. But if our panelists can see the Q&A and if there's anything general here that you think you would like to comment on further or um, that would be good, good for you know, this public space or general knowledge, I'll just give you a moment to, to look at those. Um, but if not, is there, is there anything there? I think someone asked if USCIS is currently accepting OPT applications as of today. And do we know the processing time? I know, Kathleen, you talked about OPT. Maybe just repeat the answer to that one. Yeah, sure. So absolutely, you, you can still submit your applications. Um, as uh, Jim Hammerschmidt mentioned earlier, we potentially could see processing time adjustments here going forward. It's you know kind of tough to say at this time how processing times might be impacted, um, just because all of those offices are also telecommuting. Uh, so we could see that potentially slow some things down, but we will communicate that as we get a better sense for that. But yes, you definitely can go ahead and submit your OPT application. Great. And I know, I know, Megan, you did talk about um, processing requests or getting documents, but there's been questions about travel signatures, probably our most common request. Maybe you could just walk us through what the student experience would be like now in getting, requesting a travel signature on their I-20. Absolutely, yeah. So all of our staff, our advising staff, um, will communicate with you about how to get the travel signature, but once you submit that, 
that is me, <laughs> um, who is printing out those I-20s and making sure you get those I-20s with the travel signatures. So all you would need to do is submit a document request form to our office. The document request form can be found on our website, the OIS website. That is a form fillable document, so you would just need to fill it out, save it as a PDF, and send it to OIS at uic.edu. Uh, once you send that form to the email, um, we then process that, print out a new I-20 for you. Once we get that request, we're going to send you information about options for shipping. So we cannot do this in person, obviously. So once we know what type of shipping you would like, would you like express shipping to your home country? Are you still in Chicago? Would you like that sent to Chicago? Maybe you're in some other location in the United States. We can send um, the document, the I-20 with the travel signature. Um, to wherever you would like us to. So we would communicate with you about the shipping, and then we would send that document out. Um, shipping is, is going out a little less frequently just because it does require us to um, have a little bit different process for making that happen. So just be patient with us where that is concerned, but the documents are going out um, as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the, the travel signature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like aside from the you know, shipping the document, it's not a whole lot different than yeah. what students experienced before when they picked the document up in our office. And just to reiterate yeah. too, I saw one. can I just say real quick, Anna, you don't actually need a travel course. signature to depart the United States. So the travel signature is not verified when you are going to the airport to catch a flight to leave the U.S. You need the travel signature when you're coming back into the United States. Customs and Border Protection will check to make sure that you have a travel signature that has actually been issued within the past year. It's best practice that you get a signature every six months, um, but CBP will accept a signature that is no more than a year old. So um, there's you know, no need to panic if you need to leave um, and you have a signature that's only a few months old um, and your plan is to come back sometime in the summer or the fall, um, most likely that signature is still going to be valid. But again, if you have any questions about that, if you would like us to take a look, take a picture of your I-20, is this last travel signature still valid? Send it to us by email. We'd be happy to take a look at your document and recommend, recommend whether or not you need a new travel signature. Great. I think that's a really helpful point about being able to leave without the travel signature just when you come back. Um, I saw another question that I thought was an interesting one. So, Someone was asking, what are the steps for a student who is overseas whose I-20 expires at the end of May? So this, we talked about program extensions already, but does it, the program extension process change if the person is outside the U.S. and they're applying? Um, no, the process uh, only changes in the way that we're getting the documents. So the requirements for program extension are still unchanged. Um, you would have to have the academic reason. You would have to show that you've made progression within your program in order to be eligible for a program extension. So an extension of the program end date on your I-20. So you would uh, submit the extension application via email to us. Um, sometimes though, right now, the applications are kind of coming in piecemeal. So we're getting the, the application portion for the student from the student, and then the academic department is following up with their part of the form as well as their letter that substantiates the need. Hello, okay, I think we're back. Okay. <laughs> um, once the coordinator in our office um, processes your extension, you're gonna get an email as you normally would stating your request has been processed and how would you like to receive the I-20? And again, it's the same process. We're happy to send the document via express mail or to you locally here in Chicago. And then that will be your proof that your I-20 has been extended and you're good to go. Great, great, thank you. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm looking through some of these questions. Panelists, is there anything you would personally like to respond to? Yeah, I see a question that was talking about um, whether or not students who maybe have on-campus employment, uh, TA ship, GA ship during the summer, if they're required to be physically present on campus. Um, 
there has been guidance released that on-campus employment can be conducted remotely as long as you are still, um, as long as that employment is still to the benefit of the university. So if you're able to conduct either your research or whatever you may be doing as a TA or a GA, um, grading, what have you, um, if you're able to complete that on-campus employment remotely, you can do that. Um, I would like to just address like an issue that comes over the OIS email kind of frequently that I think I may have seen someone um, state here. So there is a, a, a rule um, about a five-month temporary absence from the United States. And somehow information got out that automatically everyone's I-20s and visas were going to be canceled and terminated um, if they're outside the country for more than five months. I just want to reassure everyone that that is not always something that is adhered to. It should be, but that's um, at the discretion of the Customs and Border Protection whether or not they adhere to that. So it's there's never, even um, outside of a pandemic, has that ever happened where when it's more than five months, your documents are auto-completed or auto-terminated or you lose your status. Um, currently, though, SCVP has stated um, publicly that the five-month rule does not apply through the pandemic. So I just want to let everyone know if it's going to be more than five months that you're outside the country and you need to return, um, you should be fine to do so. As long as your um, I-20 and CVS record remain active. Mm -hmm. And there are flights available. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those considerations. Um, there's a quick one. Someone asked if there are any provisions to submit the OPT application to USCIS online. So applying for OPT online, what do we know about that process? So currently, no, submitting an OPT application online is not an option that, that I've been made aware of. Um, you know, the situation is fluid and always evolving. I know that SEVP, the Student and Exchange Visitor Program, is um, continually forwarding on student concerns to USCIS, who adjudicates the OPT applications. So, you know, if, if they do release new guidance or anything changes there, we will be letting students know immediately. Great. Um, Someone just asked, do we have to pay the fee every year? No. I can answer that one. <laughs> no, the CVS fee you only have to pay when you have a new CVS ID. So for most students, that is at the very beginning of their F1 status. Um, prior to entering the United States, you pay that CVS fee. And as long as you maintain the same CVS ID throughout your program, which most, most students do, um, you would know if that changed for some reason, we would let you know that. Um, you do not need to pay that CVS fee every year. That's a one-time payment. All right. Well, I guess if, our, if there's nothing else that our panelists um, want to address immediately, we could wrap things up. Um, I will say that if we if we weren't able to address your question if we weren't able to address your question um, here in the Q&A um, if you posted a question and we didn't answer it we are going to be going through these you know some of them may require a little bit of additional research um, and we will be responding to these questions in written format and making sure that um, you do get the information you need. So, so don't worry, we have a record of all of these great questions that were submitted and we appreciate your participation in that way. Um, we also will be sharing the recording of this virtual town hall, so you can re-listen to it, re-watch it, share it if you want to do so. And we are gonna be following up with additional town hall sessions. We have some of the works that are gonna focus on more financial aspects, um, some academic. We want to dedicate one to employment because that is a big question on people's minds um, and pulling in some other campus partners and experts in other areas to talk about their awareness of the situation for international students. So um, this is the first, but there is more to come. And 
I guess I will perhaps leave the last word to um, Jim, our executive director. Is there anything else you would like to share with us, Jim, before we close the town hall today? Yeah, just, you know, again, uh, kind of reinforcing what both Megan and Anna has said, that if you have questions, we're here to help. So please send them um, to them. The other thing, those, those of you that are still enrolled, and this is going to be a heavy lift, I guess, for me, but but if, you, if, if you're looking at, uh, at not being able to pay all of your bills and things like that, uh, if you could at least uh, make sure that you send me an email. I am working very closely with uh, the Dean of Students Office, the Dean of the Graduate College, as, as well as financial aid uh, to see if there's anything that, that we can do. Uh, I want to assure you that the Office of International Services is the strongest advocate uh, that we can be. I, I also uh, meet virtually uh, with some of the government agencies just to uh, make sure that they hear uh, your concerns and the concerns of higher education. Uh, so that, that's my, my words of wisdom. Uh, and that addition, um, please uh, stay safe uh, and healthy. And uh, until next week, um, uh, you know, uh, if you have send them our way. Great. Well, thank you, panelists. And thank you, attendee, for being with us today and taking the time. Um, we will be sharing information about our next UIC International Student Virtual Town Hall very shortly so that you can um, register and join us again for another discussion. Take care, and we will see you in this virtual space. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.